If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. The sermon will come primarily from verse 1. Ecclesiastes 3, starting in verse 1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I've seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for another opportunity to worship you, to acknowledge that you are our God, that everything good in our lives has come from your hand, that we are dependent upon you for all that we have, for every beat of our heart, for every breath we take. Father, I thank you that on this Lord's Day we can gather to acknowledge your greatness, your majesty, your mercy, your love. I thank you, Father, that we're able to come together as the body of Christ to seek the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, that we might go out into the world and carry out your purposes. I thank you, Father, that we are able to gather and to hear from your word. I pray you would set a guard over my lips, Lord, that I would say those things that are right and true. I pray that your word would accomplish the purpose for which you would send it out. And all these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. To everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, God tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. Then in verse 11, we're told that God has made everything beautiful in its time. Do you remember when you were a child? You didn't worry about whether you were going to have food to eat or clothes to wear, and you didn't even think twice about how the food or the clothing got there. Summer went on forever, and all you had to do was play. Do you remember how excited you got about Christmas or going to the amusement park or going hunting or fishing with your dad or maybe shopping for school clothes with your mom? Life was so carefree then, and you had so much energy and such an innocence about life. And think about the teenage years, those butterflies you felt in your stomach for that girl, or if you are a girl, for that guy who sits a couple of seats in front of you, hanging out with your friends, riding the roller coasters at King's Dominion, 
being able to eat all the pizza and hot dogs and candy you want, and it didn't even matter. Having your whole life spread out ahead of you and all the dreams you had for that life. And then for some, there's college or maybe the military, then eventually marriage and a whole new part of life to enjoy. Now you've joined your life to another person and you're ready to begin building a family. But first, there's just the two of you, the two who have become one. Then after marriage, children and a new chapter of life with new challenges and new joys. I remember reading a book in which the guy was writing about how he and his wife used to always pray with their children before they went to bed. And sometimes he said that the prayers would go on forever. His kids would pray for grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and neighbors and teachers and friends and dogs and cats and goldfish. One time he mentioned that his little girl even thanked God for her DVDs of Snow White and Cinderella, and then she prayed for the salvation of the wicked stepmother. <laughs> See, those times only happen once. You miss them and they're gone. Gifts from God that he's built into every part of life. And then there are little league games and soccer matches and ballet classes and school plays and report cards and pictures brought home from school and homemade Valentine's Day cards and first crushes and broken hearts and teaching them how to drive and then the children are gone and the house is quiet and you don't have to be anywhere and you don't need the minivan or the SUV anymore and it's just you and your spouse again, the two who are one. A new chapter begins, new things to learn, new challenges, new blessings, and then there's grandchildren, then retirement. To everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. But will you recognize those times when they come? Will you savor them? Will you realize the unique blessings hidden in the different seasons and days of our lives? I remember sometimes in my life when I've actually had that awareness. Once in my senior year of college, when I'd come back to the house that I shared with five other guys after one of my classes, and nobody else was there, I came into the house on a sunny and warm autumn afternoon and stood in front of the fireplace in our living room and I realized that I truly was happy, that I was experiencing one of the most blessed times in my life. I was young and in good health. I had some of the best and closest friends I'd ever had. I was doing well at the university and preparing to graduate that year and go on to law school. I was actively involved in my faith and took my relationship with God seriously. My immediate and extended family were all doing well and they were all still with me. I knew they loved me. I was having a great time in college. Life was great. And what's amazing is that I actually realized it at the time. And I also knew it wouldn't go on forever. That it was a season in my life. And so there in the silence of our living room, I thank God that day not just for the blessings he was giving in that season of my life, but for the ability to recognize those blessings. There have been several times in my life like that where it seemed like everything was in sync with the world and I knew I was happy and even had the presence of mind at the time to thank God for the happiness. Many of those times, by the way, have been when I was with my family or with my friends or with you folks here at the church. I remember one night several years ago, it was the summer, I think, when I was driving back from Waldorf across the Potomac River Bridge, and I just felt full, truly happy and aware of the many blessings God had given. And I remember telling God as I drove across the bridge that night that if he never gave me anything else in life, the blessings he'd already given me were enough. But they never really are, are they? 
In the Passover liturgy of the Jewish people for over a thousand years now, a song has been included that confesses to this reality. If God had brought us out of Egypt, the song begins, it would have been enough. If God had split the sea for us, it would have been enough. If God had led us through on dry land, it would have been enough. If God had provided for our needs in the wilderness for 40 years, it would have been enough. If God had fed us manna, it would have been enough. If God had given us Shabbat, the Sabbath, it would have been enough. If God had led us to Mount Sinai, it would have been enough. If God had given us the Torah, it would have been enough. But notice that in the mention of each gift that was given, the remembrance of the gift is presented as a conditional statement. If God had whatever, it would have been enough. The verse is written this way to remind the reader or the singer that before the Jewish people had the blessings mentioned from the Lord, their perspective had been that that blessing alone would be sufficient. It's a reminder that our prayers before we receive the gifts that God gives us are often something like this. God, if you'll just do this one thing for me, I promise you I'll never ask for anything else again. This one thing will be enough. But it never is. We always stand in need of God's blessings. And more to the point, we always stand in need of God. God brought Israel out of Egypt just as he had promised. It would have been enough. But then Pharaoh came after the Israelites and they found themselves with their backs to the Red Sea. And then God, having brought them out of Egypt, wasn't enough. God needed to provide a way of escape, which he did. The Red Sea split open and the way out was provided. It would have been enough. But then after escaping Pharaoh, the Israelites found themselves on the other side of the Red Sea in the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. God's bringing them out of Egypt and providing a way of escape by splitting the Red Sea wasn't enough. God needed to provide for them in the wilderness. And he did. He fed them with manna. He provided water. And for 40 years, their clothing and their shoes didn't wear out. It would have been enough. But of course it wasn't. And God continued to give and give and give and give. The truth is that God showers us with blessings every day in a multitude of ways, which ironically often causes us to take the blessings for granted and to presume that God is obligated to provide even more blessings then when we aren't given something we really want or think we need, or when something we've been given is taken from us, we get angry with God and question His goodness. The good that He did in the past isn't enough. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, we're told, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Ephesians 5, 20. Give thanks always for all things. Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Over and over again in the Bible, we're told to be thankful in all situations. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. But that perspective of gratitude in all circumstances, even in the face of great difficulty, is amazing, rare, and I would argue even an evidence of God's grace. To be able to be thankful in the face of overwhelming suffering and loss for the gifts that we still have or the gifts we once were given requires a humility and trust that is Christ-like. There's a time for every purpose under heaven, Ecclesiastes 3.1 tells us, 
as God reminds us that the blessings of this life will not last forever. That each season of life contains unique blessings and that once that season is passed, some of those blessings will never be experienced again this side of heaven. But that truth is easier to accept when there's a natural transition from one season of life to another, as in the case with going from high school to college or from being single to the married life. There can even be joy and anticipation in the transition from one stage of life to another during those times because we know that one time of joy and opportunity is being replaced with another kind of joy and opportunity. But it's much harder to face the passing seasons of life when the joy or opportunity being taken can't be replaced, as in the case of losing a loved one or losing some aspect of your health. To look back with gratitude for the joy you once had instead of living with regret over the joy you'll never know again is difficult. To everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, God tells us. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. I was reminded of the transitory nature of life's, life's blessings several years ago when I went back to West Virginia for my extended family's annual Memorial Day weekend together. Over the years, I had noticed those weekends morphing from the times I remembered as a child and teenager when I would go with my mom and grandma, my aunts, uncles, and cousins to meet with the much larger extended family in a mountaintop cemetery where my maternal great-grandparents were buried. Those family reunions of hundreds that I remember as a child eventually shrank to a smaller gathering of dozens and then a gathering of 20 or 30 and then 10 to 20. The last time we went, there were less than 10 of us and for the past several years, we haven't gone up on the mountain on Memorial Day at all. If God had simply allowed me to be born into the nuclear family that he gave me, it would have been enough. If God had given me aunts and uncles who loved me and with whom I had good times, it would have been enough. If God had given me cousins who were like my best friends, it would have been enough. If God had given me parents who celebrated 60 years of marriage together, it would have been enough. If God had allowed me to go to even one of those family reunions on the mountain that helped give me a greater sense of who I am and where I came from, it would have been enough. But of course it never is, is it? In a column that he wrote after the passing of his mother at the age of 98, political columnist George Will reflected on the importance of gratitude as we face the passing seasons of life. At 98, her body was exhausted by disease and strokes, Will informed, and dementia, that stealthy thief of identity, had bleached her vibrant self almost to indistinctness, like a photograph long exposed to sunlight. The aging that conquered my mother Louise was like a mighty scourge and like war, elicited nobility from those near its vortex. The nearest was Fred Will, my father and her husband of more than six decades. Near the end of his life, he shared with us children some poetry he'd written for Louise. 
including this poem from 1933. The warm sun beams through the clear air upon glistening leaves, and the birds sweep in long arcs over the green grass. They seem to say, this might last forever, but it doesn't. So if you're eight years old, enjoy being eight. Twelve will come soon enough. And if you're twelve, enjoy being twelve. And if you're sixteen, enjoy being sixteen. And if you're twenty-seven, enjoy being twenty-seven. And if you're forty, enjoy being forty. And if you're seventy, enjoy being seventy. God has made everything beautiful in its time. And He's made those beautiful things for you as an expression of His goodness, as an expression of His love, as a foretaste of what's to come. Because it never really is enough, is it? And it's not meant to be. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. And so this life is the teaser. We're waiting for the sequel. Let's pray. You know, in Ecclesiastes, the, one of the things the writer mentions is not only that God would bless him, but that he would recognize the blessings when they're there. Because so often we're preoccupied with what we don't have yet that we miss out on what we do have now. So I want you to, first of all, thank God for all the gifts that he's given you. There are too many of them to count. Every one of them has come from him as an expression of his love for you. Every one of them has come from him. And then I want you to ask God to help you to realize the blessing when it's happening. To not miss it. Because there are some things that happen, some blessings, they happen once and they're gone. Ask God to help you recognize the blessings when they happen and to be thankful to actually express appreciation. In a moment, we're going to remember that greatest blessing he's given us, the gift of his own son. We're going to remember the sacrifice Jesus made. The love poured out on the cross for you. Ask God to help you appreciate that sacrifice. That love. And while you're talking with God about these things, maybe you're with us today and you haven't yet come to know the one who is the author of your life. the one who has given you everything that's good in your life. If you're with us, with us this morning and you're not sure where you stand with God, you do realize that you're a sinner. You realize you stand in need of forgiveness. 
Do you believe that Jesus is the means through which that forgiveness can come? If that's where you are this morning, you have a chance right now to receive that gift, that greatest of all gifts that he wants to give you.